there anybody you don't know in here? Do I still have to introduce you? You know, Lou um, and Stephanie? I don't, know. I don't know Lou and Stephanie. Yes. Hi. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Hey, guys. I think that's Hi, Abby. Nice, names, nice to meet you. Hi. Nice to meet you as well. I'm hey. sure we're connected on social media anyway. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Then for Lou and Stephanie's benefit, um, if folks don't know Abby, Abby um, is originally from the Albany, New York area. She moved down to Florida last year. Uh, I met her at the Confirm it in 2018 and learned in the last two years why she's a leader of, of our, not just locally, but of, of the whole society. Um, Abby's a keynote speaker and author, a business consultant. Uh, she spent 15 years at a Fortune 500 company. Uh, now she's the CEO of her own company called Abby Leads. Uh, and for those of you that weren't here when we started talking, make sure you connect with her on social media. She's down in Tampa, Florida. She sends us pictures of sunsets and all beautiful things, which is really great. Um, I'm reading Rita's session. All right, maybe you want to wait a couple more minutes, Abby? Um, sure, yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to wait. Yeah. Rita just put a note on the bottom that uh, another session is ending shortly. And since we only have nine in here, we'll wait a couple more minutes. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Perfect. But for you guys aren't connected yet on social media, once you connect with Abby now, and then, you know, since we have a cold rain up here today, she'll post a sunset of 80 oh. degrees down there and we'll all get jealous tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I might, I thought I should probably like put a jacket on, you know, for the session, but it's 86 degrees here. So it's hard to like do that, you know, it's really hard to like remember what it's kind of like this weird mind thing where you're like wait what month is it because it is you know it's nice all the time and um it's <laughs> it's great but sometimes you get a little bit like thrown by that um fact no, the leaves are changing up here and you know that whole thing so you if, yes. since you were what 100 miles north of me in albany yes yes farther. exactly mm -hmm. yeah i um a friend of mine posted about a week ago on facebook about how they had to turn their heat on for the first time and that was always like the thing you know like what date do you go without your you know needing to turn the heat on in, in upstate new york so um i remember those days well <laughs> those years well <laughs> sorry i'm honoring we have a another text group going here looks like they're having trouble with the other session with polling and something so Oh. We'll do yours right in the beginning since it seemed to work. Oh no, okay. <laughs> Hopefully we have no tech issues. Uh, but if something goes out and you can't hear me anymore, just, you know, give me a wave or something. Well, well Tony can start talking because he... <laughs> That's true. Yeah, absolutely. Any of you guys could really just jump in and do this. I could flip through my slides and you can kind of fill in what it should say. So. I've learned more from uh, from everybody in this room than, uh, than anything else combined, I think. I watched somewhere where they have a, a, a it might have been Toastmasters, but anyway, they have a competition where, where you get up on stage and present on a, on a deck of slides you've never seen. Uh, I love that. And it is, and some people pull it off. Like, like, like so they're, they're speaking gibberish very convincingly. That's so fun. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Very cool. Abby, I don't know if you were planning on saying this as part of your presentation, but can you tell us um, about the company you started? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I will get into a little bit of my story about why I started it, but, uh, but essentially it's called Abby Leads. And what I do is um, I've been writing for a couple of years, uh, doing uh, mostly blogs uh, for the institutes about insurance and some leadership type topics and risk management. Uh, and I really, uh, I really love writing. And like, uh, I think everybody in this call, you're all insurance nerds, right? So I love insurance. And so I was trying to figure out a way to kind of combine that. And with the move, it sort of makes you think in a different way, right? It refreshes you. So, um, so I have been doing um, uh, speaking engagements like this, keynote speaking and writing. So I write for Risk and Insurance Magazine, as well as the Institute's and uh, looking to kind of expand that piece a little bit further, um, but most of it staying within that risk management and um, and leadership uh, realm of, of writing. So uh, really trying to just grow it, you know, in those areas, um, doing some, some work along the way with things like SEO consulting and 
um, a little bit of like copywriting and stuff, just, you know, kind of figuring it out, you know, COVID changed a lot of the direction that I had been going in, you know, certainly when you're doing keynote speaking, um, and then there's no in-person engagements that changes it, but luckily there's a lot of engagements like this that, um, that maybe have, uh, have made it even better because of the lack of need to travel. So it's a little easier to piece together some of those things. So, you know, after 15 years of a carrier, I just kind of wanted to try something a little different at first, you know, and I was at a big carrier, you know, so it's kind of neat to be um, just answering to myself now and picking projects that are really cool to me. So um, I've had that flexibility over the last year or so, which, um, which has been really neat. So happy to see things picking up after COVID though, and um, some companies hiring and, you know, contracts starting back up here going into the fourth quarter. So I think you know, I'm an optimist by nature, but I think things are, are kind of looking good too. All right. For, if you folks aren't watching the chat box, um, another session is still wrapping up. I don't know, I guess somebody was very verbose, but uh, hopefully that'll wrap up in a minute or two. And once we get a, a couple more people in the room, we'll have you start, Abby, I guess. Okay, um, awesome. I'll remind everybody too, once they come in again, that it's being recorded and including the chats, but I mean, uh, I'm gonna monitor the chat so you don't have to unless you want to respond to people. I don't know how interactive you want people to be, Abby, it's up to you. Okay. Yeah, it'll be easier for me if you kind of monitor it sort of throughout and then um, I'll get back into being able to watch it at the end, um, you know, a little bit better, so. So then we'll do like a Q&A at the end? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, unless you see something hugely pressing and you're like, oh, wait, I need to stop her. I, I trust your judgment on that, Rick. Who is it that went long? Is it Patrick's session? I can tease him about it later. Um, let me look. <laughs> huh. Why am I not that? Isn't it Pat Taparito? Oh, it's probably, yeah, probably Pat Separi, you're right. Yeah, it, it mean, you were in here, Abby. We weren't paying attention, oh, apparently. No. <laughs> Do you think it's worth it to just get started? Um, you might as well, you get, again, a reminder, everybody, that uh, we're recording and including the chats and, and private messages, so... Don't flirt with anybody unless you want to record it forever. And uh, Abby, go right ahead. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so thanks, everyone, again, for being here. This uh, session, we're going to talk about change management. And I will uh, go into a, a little bit on change management models and, um, and some strategies. I will say that this topic is, is huge. So if you have a particular interest in this and you go out after the session and Google it, you will find so many more models and theories uh, that you can kind of pick and choose from. So you might find one that I talk about that really appeals to you, um, or maybe um, maybe they all do and, and you want to pick and choose, you know, between them a little bit. So certainly I think um, you might be able to do that today. So uh, before we uh, talk about the theory uh, behind it. Let's talk a little bit about change and particularly what happens to you when everything changes. And this topic is, I think, quite timely this year because of what's going on with the pandemic, uh, but it wouldn't make it any less timely if we were talking about this last year or the year before. Uh, we had that presentation from Rob this morning talking about the end of insurance. That's certainly a huge change in itself, right? But we've been talking about the disruption from fintech and insurtech and startups and insurance companies uh, creating um, uh, partnering with, with venture capitalists and creating new firms and trying to do things differently. And uh, even if we weren't talking about that, we might be talking about mergers and acquisitions and how your role is affected by that or your company is affected by that, how you, know, you may be needing a change at work or going through a change at work, uh, or perhaps it's something in your personal life. So 
the things that we're going to talk about today can apply to both, whether it's a change that you're going through in, in work uh, or uh, in your personal life. And a lot of this can, can really help you when it's a change that's kind of imposed on you. So in, in my own story, what happened uh, to me is that last year and uh, 2019, honestly, it feels like 10 years ago now, but the beginning of 2019, I had a few things had changed my life and I knew that I needed to make a big change. I needed to do something different. I had lived in New York my whole life and uh, I owned a little house in upstate New York and I worked for the same company again for uh, at that point about 14 years. And, uh, and I wanted to make a change. So I decided that I was going to relocate started looking where. Um, I had told this uh, to a few folks earlier in the call, but I was looking at states that had no uh, income tax because uh, I was single and so I could move wherever I wished. So uh, let's set ourselves up financially well. So I was looking at states with no income tax and then I was narrowing it down to warm weather because again, New York, upstate New York for my whole life. So I wanted just to be in, uh, in the waves and, and all the time. So I narrowed it down to either Florida or Texas as a camp, Tampa or Austin. I spent most of the early part of 2019 putting my house on the market um, and looking to sell it, uh, financially getting ready for that and everything else. Went on the market in August and in September, I went to the CPCU conference last year. It was in New Orleans. Uh, we had a great time. I met a lot of you for the first time and saw, I think, most of you there. And, uh, and I came back from that conference on such a professional high, if you will, ready to sort of take what I learned and tackle problems and figure out the best way to share some of the really cool things that I learned uh, from, from all of you in the educational sessions and the, the amazing networking. Um, I just come back so pumped from these industry conferences, which I know that I'll be tonight. I'd hardly be able to sleep after all of the insurance nerd stuff that we've been doing, right? And, uh, and so I was so excited and I came back, this was September, my first day back to work was Thursday. It was September 26. And, uh, and in the morning, my boss pinged me and it was, uh, she pinged me at 926 actually, around 926 and said, uh, do you have a minute? And I said, yes. I was so excited to like let her know how it had gone and hear what had happened. I had a 930, but I was gonna call my boss real quick. So she calls me and she says, um, oh, uh, you know, our boss is on the line as well. I'll call her um, Jill for confidentiality. Jill's on the line. So I'm like, oh, hey, Jill, you know, she's a CPCU too, actually. And, um, and I remember what she said to me. She actually said, oh, this isn't uh, a friendly call. And I was like, ooh, what, is that? Or, ooh, what does that mean? I've never actually heard that at work. Um, or maybe in my personal life either. I don't know. <laughs> it's a tough thing to hear. So this is not a friendly call. So I'm like, oh, no. So actually, uh, in that call, they laid me off. So I had been with the company for 15 years. And uh uh, it was a complete shock, you know, they just paid to send me to this conference and I came back ready to, you know, solve problems and, and work and, and, and dive in. So they were um, giving me this canned speech and I'm listening to this and thank goodness, you know, for, for mute on your mobile phone, right? So I, I, I didn't, you know, have to kind of say anything for a few minutes, but I'm listening to her and my heart is just beating out of my chest at this point. Like, you know, those moments where like you can hear it in your in your head and, and feel it in your body. And it's not like a great feeling. I didn't love this. So don't really want to feel like that again, but sort of, you know, physiologically, uh, those responses take over and you can't really respond in the moment. So I'm grateful that the, the canned speech is kind of long. So there was a bit that she went through, which of course, I don't think I heard a word of, but luckily you get an email. So I, uh, I was kind of in shock by this. And when you, um, when I think about that, the name of this presentation is Life After Leaping In. So you might recall uh, Cheryl Sandberg's book, uh, Cheryl Sandberg from Facebook, she wrote um, a book in uh, 2013 or so, it was called um, Lean In. And, uh, and a lot of companies really jumped on that. This book was about empowering women in the workforce and, um, and how, how uh, women can get ahead even through some challenges that they may face in particular challenges um, uh, in business. And it was a really, really popular book. And, um, and a lot of companies, my own included, had lean in groups where, which I facilitated actually managed where you network with women around the company and, and kind of have different educational sessions and speakers. 
and I kind of loved it. So, um, you know, to me, when I got into insurance, I was right out of college and I, I kind of fell into it, but it turned out that I loved it and I started earning designations and obviously the CPCU, I earned my MBA along the way and I, um, I did, I taught classes, insurance classes to teach other folks, uh, CPCU and AIMS stuff. Um, I volunteered for things, so cat duty. I was in claims, which, um, which I adored. I did cat duty and Saturday shifts, and um, I was a supervisor and you know leading different groups and such. So I didn't just lean into my job. I, I leaped into it kind of with everything that I had. I really, again, my first corporate job out of college, I was so excited to, to kind of do this job, but I also really felt an affinity for claims. I loved um, being that sort of arm of insurance that fulfills the promise and working with customers. And, you know, you, you, you can't really answer phones during cat duty and not feel, you know, compelled to appreciate what we do for a living. And all of this kind of forced me into, you know, this position where, or pushed me into a position, maybe I should say, where I was just leaping in and everything I had into this job. So when I heard got this news that I was being laid off, it was, you know, A, it was shocking. I, I said earlier too, I'm an optimist, but probably a little naive. I didn't think I would be the one that, that kind of, uh, where the math worked out that I got laid off, um, but I was. And so all of a sudden I had this, you know, sort of new reality where I was looking to make this huge, you know, life change and relocate across the country and go from from the blizzard to the beach. And all of a sudden it, it wasn't going to be with the security of the job that I had, had held for the last you know, decade and a half. And the house that I'd lived in actually for the same amount of time uh, with you know, the friends and, and the street that I, I was on and so forth. Um, and so the day after I got the news that I got laid off, my realtor called me in the morning and told me that uh, I had uh, the first offer on my house. So actually now um, my head was, was all of these different things <laughs> kind of spinning because what now? Um, I have barely decided, you know, do I still go or do I stay? You know, what happens when kind of the, the bottom falls out and everything changes? Um, so, uh, uh, you know, kind of taking a look at the, the words on the slide, um, you know, I can't really see the chat yet. I will afterwards, but drop a, a word or a phrase in the chat. Do any of these sort of appeal to you? Do you handle change in, in any of the same way? You know, is it is it tiring or energizing for you? You know, is it, is it thrilling or scary? Because it's kind of all of these things to me, you know, and all of this was kind of just bubbling around in my mind. And I was trying to figure out, okay, I need to put some, you know, process to this, the normal things that, that I would do, you know, maybe yoga or some meditation or, or different things, you know, they weren't really working um, when everything in my life was changing and a lot of it was being imposed on me. So, um, so my head felt like this um, and it was pretty wild. So uh, I, I, I do want to say though that it, it ended up working out positively for me. The picture on the left uh, is what I left behind in New York. I left in um, early December of last year. Uh, this farm was, was kind enough to, to visit right before I left. It's my Mini Cooper covered in snow out my back door. Um, and uh, the last one that I had to shovel, uh, which is good. I have um, an old um, undiagnosed rotator cuff injury that uh, shoveling kind of exacerbated. So I'm grateful to give that hobby up. Um, and the right is one of those sunset pictures that you'll see if you follow me on social media. This is off of my back deck um, and we've got a nice view of the bay here. So it worked out um, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, kind of how that ended up working out. Uh, before I get into that, let's talk a little bit about you. Um, take a look at this slide and uh, kind of pick out uh, who of these six folks uh, in history around the world um, do you sort of relate to for your change style? We have um, a few different folks here. Uh, you know, if you if you look at, you know, maybe Wayne Dyer, um, he's saying change the way you look at things and the things you look at change. Um, that probably sounds familiar to you. Um, or, you know, maybe you're, you're more like um, Mary Shelley, nothing is so painful that the human mind is a great and sudden change. It's a little dramatic um, and negative maybe, but 
uh, sorry about that, but um, uh, you know, maybe you're, you're relating to what she thinks, you know, kind of take a look at this one. We're gonna revisit these folks a little bit later on in the presentation. Uh, so maybe keep in mind who you are. Maybe you're a hybrid, um, maybe you're a little Coco Chanel and, um, and Ovid together, um, you know, so kind of keep in mind how you normally react to change. Um, I want to put up a, a poll question as well. So Rick, if you're still with me, if you might open up the poll uh, for us. This is just one quick question, uh, super simple. Um, and it just asks you, you know, how do you feel about change? And I know you probably want a lot more options in here, but just pick negative or positive. We're going to leave this open for a minute. Um, because, uh, you know, we just really want to get like a baseline for, um, for how you guys are feeling about it. So negative or positive, you know, there's really no right or wrong here, obviously. Um, you know, and maybe uh, it depends on situation or the day, but overall, you know, are you, do you tend to trend more um, negatively or positively towards change? So, um, Rick, do we have a, a decent number of responses? Uh, on the poll or should we leave it open? We have 15 of 21. We'll wait, well maybe we'll wait another 20, 30 seconds and then stop. Okay, perfect, awesome. So, you know, in general, uh, since I'm giving this presentation, you can probably guess my feeling is it tends to skew a little more positive about change. Um, you know, the one thing that that's always comforted me about it is uh, the fact that uh, change brings opportunity that didn't exist before. So um, if nothing else, um, that's helped me to think positively about it. All right, Abby, the results of your poll are 75% positive and 25% negative. Nice. That's awesome, you guys. Ah, I love it. Okay, perfect. So you are mostly skewing positive and, um, and that's amazing. Thank you for that. And thank you also for your participation. And thanks, Rick, for administering it. So remember your person here. We're going to skip ahead now and, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about a couple of those change management models. Again, you can take what's good of these, take what appeals to you, um, and go ahead and Google it a little bit further and probably get a whole lot more uh, information out there. So let's look at, um, at a model from McKinsey first. So this is a model that McKinsey developed. It's called the 7S model for obvious reasons. And uh, two, um, two engineers at McKinsey developed this in the 70s. They were looking to identify um, the internal elements of an organization that, if, uh, that all needed to align in order for the organization to be successful. So this model um, you can apply it to a personal change or to an organizational change. It might be easier to view it looking at it related to an organizational change, um, but it helps to improve performance um, and, and helps you, if you're looking to figure out a way maybe to determine or implement a, a new strategy, for example. So looking at the model, you can see that each of the uh, circles, each of the S's around it and, and shared values in the middle, they're all connected and interconnected to each other with these different chains and lines sort of connecting them. So it becomes clear to see from this model that if you make a change to one of these, it will affect the others. So if you have a change uh, to staffing, uh, for example, it will end up changing your structure, it will change your systems. Um, you know, maybe shared values is um, something that will end up affecting maybe your style. Um, when McKinsey put this together, they identified three of these elements as what they called um, hard elements. They identified your strategy, your structure, your systems, your three across the top. They call these your, your hard elements. They're things that are um, that management has more of an influence over. So um, the strategy of the company the, uh, maybe the IT systems, the um, technology systems, maybe the structure that's in place, uh, the org chart or the way that people relate together or the landscape structure, maybe right now it's, it's that work from home. Uh, so these top three, the hard elements are things that management has a little bit more control over. The bottom four, including shared values, those are what 
McKinsey calls soft values. These are um, less tangible. They're a little bit harder to maybe describe and maybe harder for management to influence. So, um, so understanding from this model that each of the seven elements uh, affects each other uh, and the fact that each of them needs to be in balance uh, for this model to, uh, to keep working. So you can, uh, like I kind of mentioned when we introduced it, you can take this model and use it to evaluate how a change will affect the rest of what you're doing. You can remember uh, whether it's a hard element or a soft element and whether it may be an easier change to influence or harder change. If it's on a hard element like a systems change, perhaps management can just put it into place. If it's something uh, maybe where you're affecting the style or the company culture, the shared values that people that work with you have, that might be something that's harder to influence as management. Um, but knowing the way that these, uh, each of these modules inter, uh, inter work together can help you to understand how you might make a change. So if you were to use this model, one way that McKinsey lays out is to start with the middle, look at your shared values and, uh, and ask questions if your shared values align to your hard elements. So again, the ones across the top, your strategy, structure, systems, are they uh, in balance and, and in sync? Do they align and is there harmony there? And if so, uh, then you move on and, and look to see if those um, hard elements then relate to your soft elements. Uh, are they again in sync and in balance? And if not, this gives you a place to start of where you might start to make tweaks uh, as you look to maybe implement a change in strategy or structure or in staffing. The next model I have a feeling is probably very familiar to you uh, and you might have used this um, in your day jobs. I think that ADCAR is, uh, is used quite often and uh, and this one I really like because it's a very simple way to kind of break down where people are at. So if you are, let's say, looking to make an organizational change, you might use this to identify where your stakeholders are at. If you're doing a stakeholder analysis, doing an ad car of those individuals can help you understand where they are in relation to your change. And then you can use that to help move them along. So, uh, so looking at the model, um, the first A at the top is for awareness. Uh, this is awareness of the need to make change. Um, you, uh, you may need to explain the reason for the change here. You can uh, explain the change early and often, the reason for it. Make sure that, that, um, that individuals are aware of the reason for the change. Um, by the way, this works with yourself too. <laughs> if you're trying to go through something and um, it's like those stages that you're going to go through when you're going through a big change um, because uh, inevitably uh, you, you will go through different feelings um, and you might uh, regress and move back and forth along it um, but um, but having something like this model to to put some uh, method to your madness um, can be really really helpful when you're in the midst of it um, take it from me it's um, when I decided to do all of these big life changes at once uh, last year, um, I really needed something to make sense of it. So, so awareness of the need for change. Uh, the D is for desire, uh, desire to support the change. So when you're thinking of your organization and you're supporting a change there, you might think this one, this bullet really is that what's in it for me idea. So if you want people to support your change, um, it's helpful to point out uh, what's in it for them, why they want to make the change. How does making this change benefit them? Like how is the, the new outcome actually better than the old outcome? Uh, and if you can identify that, then, then you can tap into people's desire to make change um, and your own desire to make change. You, you probably wouldn't be really supportive or excited about a change in your life if you couldn't say to yourself that the that the final outcome of your change will be better than current situations. Why would you make a change um, if you can avoid it that isn't better? So, um, so desire to support change. The, the K is for knowledge, um, knowledge of how to change. Um, so in an organization, this could include things like training, offering support and resources to individuals. So 
that they know how to actually do the new process and how to be successful in uh, in wherever that change is taking them. So, um, so it could be things that um, that people you know may have that desire to do the change and support it, but they don't have the knowledge uh, for it. The next one relates right back to it. The second A in in ad cars for ability, and that's that ability to demonstrate the change or the new skills and behaviors needed for the change. So. You know, again, you might have all the desire in the world to make a change, um, and maybe you even have the knowledge of it, but you don't yet have the ability to demonstrate it. So, um, you know, as you're kind of going along and making that change, you know, for me, I knew um, that I I knew I needed to make a change in my life and move, um, and I wanted to relocate. I had the desire, you know, I had the knowledge. I I knew. Um, I, a, a lot about moving companies and pods and, and storage units and how to actually make this move and, and about mortgages and selling my house and renting apartments and things that I, I knew too much about. Um, and, you know, but did I have the ability, you know, to, can you demonstrate the skills and behaviors? So, um, so if you're in an organization, maybe here's where you can monitor how people are uh, demonstrating the new skills, um, help them to uh, uh, adjust. If they need to make a change, you know, um, let them uh, fail fast and kind of bring them back and make a new uh, a new change. Um, and that leads into your R, which is reinforcement. So reinforce that new behavior um, to help people make that change stick. Uh, you know, I think the famous um, the habits uh, should stick in, in three weeks, right? I recently read something that actually said it was a lot longer, something like 55 days. Um, so, uh, so it takes a little while anyway to make um, a new change your habit um, and to make it stick. So, um, so this reinforcement, uh, the R is really that important part. Um, it, it takes time to adopt a new change. So reinforcing when we're getting it right really helps want to uh, uh, continue it. And then the third model that I want to share with you, uh, this one is interesting. This is um, from a gentleman, Dr. Cotter, and um, he studied organizational change and personal change uh, for several decades and put together uh, his observations into this change model and what I really like about it, um, A, I like this, uh, this visual because it, it shows it kind of like a, a staircase, each step is building on each other. But what it's really doing is um, it's uh, taking success factors and kind of extracting how to get there. And it's showing you that kind of all along the way, even before you get to the last bullet, which is instituting change, you're recruiting people and getting other people on your side. You're persuading people how to uh, uh, see the benefit in this change. So um, as I talk about this last model, you're probably thinking and reflecting back on the two that we just talked about, about McKinsey and about ADCAR as well. And there's a lot of similarities here. Um, and that's, that's definitely by design. There are uh, overlaps. So as you start to think about how to go about uh, change management and maybe using a model to help yourself or your organization get there, um, you'll see that uh, a lot of the ideas are very similar. So the steps might differ in their wording. Uh, maybe one appeals more to you than another. ADCAR had five, this one's eight. Um, you know, McKinsey again was a seven, seven S. Uh, so each one will be slightly different, but you'll see that, that a lot of the steps are really similar. So, um, so Cotter really talked about um, first starting with uh, what's in it for me. It's helping others see the need for change. He really promoted this idea of starting with writing an, an aspirational change statement. So describing why you want to make the change. Again, why, why you'll be better off after the change than you are before it. So creating that sense of urgency um, within yourself or within uh, the stakeholders, helping others to see that need for change um, kind of is, is the baseline here uh, for Cotter. His second step there um, is where he wants you uh, to then recruit help. So people that, um, that are kind of the leaders and seeing the need for change, how can you bring them in and, um, and help them guide uh, the rest uh, to kind of get to the change. So it's for spreading that idea around and, and making um, uh, other folks the agents for change here. 
to lead it along and then go ahead and form that strategic vision and initiative. So this is where you're really clarifying how the, the future will differ from the past. How will it look better than the past? Um, you know, what is that strategic vision that can, can um, build upon your inspirational <laughs> statement that, uh, that you wrote back in step one? How is it that folks can make the future a reality? So figure out what those initiatives are. This one really, this model really helps you, I think, in this step to, um, to lay it out if you're someone who likes to um, outline things on paper and really see steps A, B, C, D in a row, figure out how logically you're gonna go through it. Um, this model might appeal. You can, you can spend some time here on step three going through and really forming that, um, that idea of how you're going to make the, the future, that better future picture that we've laid out, how you're going to make that a reality. Uh, and then number four, you know, people really, people have to buy in. Um, you, uh, and, and again, if this is a personal change, you have to buy into it um, and uh, figure out a way to, to work together, work towards a common good. Um, he called it enlisting a volunteer army. It's that idea of um, uh, finding a way to create a sense of urgency in others um, so that they want to fulfill those initiatives and that strategic vision that we've laid out and, and get to the point of the change. Uh, removing obstacles and taking out any barriers that are in the way to change, any um, roadblocks that people are going to encounter that they do encounter so that uh, the change can actually happen. Um, number six, generating those short-term wins. This is that celebration period. It was kind of that reinforcement that we talked about the last step in ADCAR, the R in the reinforcement. Um, you're going to recognize you want to communicate, share wins, you know, find quick wins here. People are really motivated by um, by success and by having a quick win. So um, I, I'm certain you've experienced this in yourself or maybe um, Maybe when you were studying for CPCU, that's something we can all relate to. You might have rewarded yourself when you um, finished an exam or passed an exam or finished a chapter, um, you know, and taken a break or rewarded yourself with something fun um, and um, maybe some time off studying or a, a little treat or something because we um, humans are really motivated by that. So if you can find ways to um, let people have early success, um, that really motivates them to, uh, to keep going. So you generate those short-term wins, um, share them, celebrate them, um, and then keep riding that energy forward. So seven is kind of sustaining that acceleration. So once you have that, that win, that momentum should keep building um, and, and keep moving you forward. So it's not resting on your laurels of that success, it's, um, it's pushing harder after success, maybe change after change, maybe it's taking that quick break to celebrate and then it's pushing forward even harder and building on, on what you've gotten to. Um, and then number eight, you know, making that new change of habit. Again, we talked about that before with both of the first two models. It's how do you then um, create habit out of this new change um, that you've been working to, uh, to create and to reinforce, um, you know, continuing it and reinforcing it until, until it is habit um, of instituting that change. Have you have five minutes. Unfortunately, we have to end on time. Okay. Because we no. have a 10 minute break and then our next session start at 225. No problem. Thank you. So let's go through some change management strategies. So um, remember who your person was in the beginning? You've got three of them here. So we're on the next slide, I'll have the other three if you don't see your person on this slide. Um, so this slide uh, and the one after it gives you just kind of quick little small ways to tweak what you normally do um, and, uh, and maybe do it differently. So maybe if you related to Coco Chanel, you know, fashion changes with style indoors, maybe take little steps out of your comfort zone. Maybe find a different way to, to kind of do that. Um, and then our next slide, we're gonna look at the next three folks, right? So, uh, so if you related to these three folks, you know, find your color on the right. You know, maybe if you were um, very Shelly, you wanna look to try to see the positives. <laughs> because uh, there certainly are a lot of those within change. Again, it change creates those opportunities that 
didn't exist before, even if it's a change being pushed on you um, and something that seems negative in the beginning, like a layoff, there are opportunities uh, that you didn't have uh, before that actually happened to you. One simple tool on positive you've seen before is a SWOT analysis. So a way, a strategy to deal with change um, is to do a SWOT analysis out of it. Look at the strengths, the weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And this can help you to see those items a little more clearly where maybe you didn't before. Um, it's an easy tool uh, and it's familiar to a lot of us. So it's kind of cool to use this um, to help you when you need to make uh, some type of a change. Take a moment to talk about normalcy bias. Um, I use the lightning because Tampa Bay actually is one of the lightning strike capitals of the world. Um, also go Bolts um, if you're a hockey fan. Uh, but normalcy bias is actually a cognitive bias that leads us to believe that things will go back to normal um, and, and more quickly than they will. We think that uh, in a natural disaster, for example, we might minimize the threat. Um, we may think that we'll be safer than we are. We may go back to due diligence, uh, go back to normal without due diligence because um, we don't actually believe that the threat's there. We think things will go back to normal. Um, the problem is that uh, after a change, um, we aren't going back to the way it was before. Something is now different. So if we can just forget normalcy bias, remember that it exists, but let it go because you're not actually going back to your normal. We know that things aren't going back to the way they were before COVID, for example. Even if the only remnants are wearing masks in public, staying at home more often, um, the normalcy bias leads you to think, oh, it's going to go back to the way it was. Um, but unfortunately, uh, or maybe fortunately, it's not. So if we remember normalcy bias is our way that we're going to be thinking, um, it can help you to, to let it go. Um, and think, okay, you know, the new normal is going to be, uh, is going to be just as good as that opportunity that didn't exist. And I think this is your, this is my last slide, actually, Rick. So we're at the end. But um, this idea of a change continuum, this kind of brings us back up from the negativity of normalcy bias. So, um, so if you think about change and the outcomes of change, let's say there's one or the other, right? Choice A and choice B, very, very unlikely that one choice, choice A is gonna be the, the total negative end. It's gonna be the worst outcome ever. And choice B would have been the best outcome ever, the most amazing thing ever. And more than likely, they're kind of on the continuum in the middle here where you know one might be a little better than the other, one might be a little worse, one might be a little better at different times for different reasons and different ways. I had moved to um, Austin, I'd be wearing cowboy boots and listening to, to country music more often. I'm, I'm not, I'm in Tampa, I'm at the beach, um, and both things are awesome, right? So it's this idea that change and outcomes exist on a continuum where um, whatever decision you make, it's not going to end up being uh, absolutely awful um, or probably absolutely amazing. It's going to fall somewhere there in the middle um, and um, and that can kind of give you some comfort as you're looking to make a change that maybe is something that that's being pushed on you. So, um, so I'm going to stop here. This is some contact information for me. Um, you can go ahead and grab the QR code uh, or just look me up on LinkedIn. I'm on Interact if you're a CPCU member. Um, or the email, my website's just abbyleads.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter, pretty active, but I think I'm probably connected with a lot of you already. So, um, so thank you for your time today. Thank you to New Jersey CPCUs for allowing me the pleasure to speak with, the, um, with these other amazing folks today. I've really enjoyed hearing everyone. Uh, if you're a new designee, congratulations. Uh, she's been doing an amazing job this morning with the oath. Every time I hear it, I'm like, oh gosh, I can't wait to do this. It makes me so excited. So, um, so welcome to you. And I hope that we'll have an opportunity to get to know each other and work together in the future. Um, but congratulations, this is a great day for you. Uh, and with that, Rick, I don't know if we have time for questions or if you just want to end here. But um, oh, stop thanks, talking. Abby. Uh, anybody have a quick question or two for Abby? We we have a couple minutes. We can go for another maybe two or three minutes before we'll ask everybody to go into their next session. Awesome, thank you, Rick. We'll be informal, so just uh, turn your camera on, unmute your mic and, and shout away if you like, if anybody has a question for Abby. What are, your, some, what are some of your preferred small wins? 
<laughs> what, do you, what do you like as those uh, little kind of sh shots of dopamine that help you uh, keep going in the right direction? Oh, gosh. Um, honestly, things like this for me are huge. Um, I love being able to talk to folks about stuff like this and, um, you know, uh, I guess um, being able to like <laughs> leave my house and drive five minutes and walk on the beach at sunset is really neat because, you know, it was a really difficult thing to move here. So <laughs> that was a pretty good win. I, um, I drove uh, you know, from New York to Florida in that Mini Cooper you guys saw in the photo with the cat in the passenger seat. And, you know, the whole time it was kind of like, um, I get very like focused and like, okay, we're just going to get this done and then move on to the next thing and the next thing. So I don't think I really celebrated the small wins enough along the way. So I like your question. I think that's a really important thing to kind of remember because, um, you know, mindfulness is, um, is kind of important as you're going through some of these things like the the process is, um, you know, is, is as exciting as the destination. Um, one thing I did appreciate and, and remember to think about a lot was along the way, there were a lot of folks that, um, that helped me when I was moving and didn't have to, you know, there was a gentleman at U-Haul who like was incredible and helped me move things and just was really great for just, you know, a stranger out of the blue, right, kind of along the way. And, and you know, it really kind of reminds you that like you're making this, this huge change and other folks are going about their life and you're interacting in this really cool way. So, um, so that was a little aside, but, uh, but thanks for the question. All right, Abby, thanks again for being part of our iDay. Um, thanks for everybody for joining today, and we hope to see you in the rest of the sessions. Uh, make sure everybody hangs around at 4 o'clock. We're going to have a virtual cocktail hour. Uh, and I don't know if Matt left or not yet, but he offered to, to pay, as he normally does at iDay, for all of our drinks. It's very generous. <laughs> Thank you not, very much, everyone. Thank you, Rick. All right, guys. Have a, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks.